I run a company called The Difference Engine. We're based in New York. We're an insight-driven product strategy company. My background really, however, is in market and design research. And I've spent about the last 15 years really doing mainly that type of work. Um, so I have a lot of war stories, some of which I will share with you today. Um, I've done some of that work here, actually. The last time I was here um, was for <laughs> focus groups related to credit cards, um, <laughs> but um, not today, thankfully. Um, instead, what I want to do is sort of talk about two sides of the coin when it comes to qualitative data. Um, and I say qualitative data, especially after the deep learning talk that Melanie gave earlier, Qualitative research is mainly a method of collecting unlabeled, unstructured data. <laughs> and then we have the cheapest, fastest, most reliable machines that we can get our hands on to label and structure that data. Those are called people. Um, and we have not really nearly enough of them. Um, they're not really cheap enough. They're not really fast enough. But that's what we work with. Um, and so that's kind of the core of our business. Um, what I want to start with, though, is sort of the five main problems that I'm sure you have all encountered um, in conducting qualitative research or collecting qualitative data. When I ask people why they don't do qualitative research, what I tend to get are one of two answers. Either it takes too long or it costs too much. Um, and there are a lot of reasons why that is the case. And, and these five reasons are kind of the, the top five things that I think contribute to the cost and lag um, that is created. But I will start with saying this. My least favorite sentence in business is, we are going to go off and do some research. Uh, because it basically suggests that we're going to stop all activity, we're going to stop all progress, a group of people are, that might not even work here are going to go somewhere else, they're going to talk to some people, maybe we will watch it, maybe we will attend, maybe we will ever look at that research ever again. Um, they will go make sense of it and they will bring it back to us with recommendations, typically in the form of a PowerPoint presentation. This is not a great way to do research. Um, <laughs> so, and, and tends to explain the cost and lag time kind of all by itself. Um, but there are sort of underlying issues. The, the first problem that we encounter typically with clients and, and with companies that we work with um, in teaching them how to kind of roll their own qualitative research programs is that they're too late. They initiate the research far too late in the process to actually be able to incorporate what they would learn from it into their product development or marketing development processes. So they will have either fully specced out a project, they will have fully produced a campaign, they will have already implemented some program, but they want to just do a gut check <laughs> at the very last minute. Um, and most of the time, I advise them not to spend the money. Uh, I am a consultant, this is dangerous to my business, um, <laughs> but I do tend to consult them, uh, or c uh, suggest to them that it's too late really to be doing this research. Their money would be better spent actually measuring what happens in market um, when, when the program is live. So that's problem number one, it's just, it happens too late. The second problem is when we start out kind of wrong about everything, when we don't agree on terms, when that word you use does not mean what you think it means. Um, and the, the first instance that I really ran into this was about 10 years ago working with eBay and they were in the middle of doing a much better segmentation study, a much more useful segmentation study that would help them understand their customers and users better. But at the time what they had was a very rough instrument. They had heavy sellers and normal sellers and they had heavy buyers and everybody else. At the time, a heavy buyer was someone who had spent more than 300 US dollars in the last three months on the platform. They didn't have to have ever bought anything before that three month period. They didn't have to have bought more than one item in that three month period. And so a very easy way at the time, 10 years ago, to spend $300 on eBay was to go buy a set of golf clubs, to buy an expensive gift for your partner for your anniversary. Uh, one of the people we interviewed had bought a jukebox um, <laughs> on the internet for, for her husband for their 10 year anniversary. Um, and then do never do anything again. So they weren't truly heavy buyers. They had just bought a high, t high dollar ticket item. Um, and so in that instance, we were talking to people that we expected to have deep knowledge about the community aspects and ratings and dispute resolution and comments and, and communication and uh, community in general and they had almost no perspective on that at all because they had made exactly one purchase ever on the platform within the last three months on a single item. 
The second instance where this really kind of came home for me was working with a company out of California that specializes in caring for older people with dementia. And in the US, we have a, a limited amount of public resources given to that type of, of care, a limited amount of insurance that covers that type of care. And so what tends to happen um, is that we deny the dementia for a very long time. And then once we actually get around to acknowledging that whoever the person in the family who is the caregiver can no longer be the only person to provide that care. It's kind of fragmented the family, perhaps repleted other, other resources financially and otherwise within the family. And so we wanted to go out and talk to people to learn more about this process of deciding to commit a loved one into care into a nursing home or other facility. And we started with the belief that because this was so expensive and so life-changing, that of course this would be a family decision. You would make this decision with your your spouse, with your parent, with siblings, with other members of your family. Um, we thought this despite the fact that both myself and the CMO of the company had already gone through this in our own families and had not experienced that to be true. We'd found that in America it was very common for one person to finally be the last man standing who makes the decision about care for this, this person with dementia and their family. And in that instance, um, when, when we actually just started trying to recruit people, we discovered that we were very, very wrong, that actually our experience was the normal experience in the US, not the experience of a kind of collaborative decision making where you have support from your family members. If we had pursued the research with that supposition, we would have talked to unicorns, people who are really not representative of the typical experience. What we found as a result, <coughs> excuse me, is that People are often very concerned about bias coming from consumers when they talk to consumers, but the real problem with bias comes from the people designing the research itself, from, from the clients and the researchers. And that bias flourishes where tradition, what we have always done, gets more investment than experimentation, exploration, and investigation. And what we think is that there's a, an important balance to strike here. Certainly you have developed best known methods. Certainly you have best practices and, and great knowledge that is deep about your customer and your business. But there are also these edge cases where you need to learn more and understand more, especially if innovation is your, is your objective. The third problem we've encountered is that our clients don't use the tools already at their disposal to learn all that they can. So they often have not looked in their analytics data, data sets. They have not looked at their sales data or CRM. They may not have one. Um, we also encounter situations where it's kind of the inverse of the not invented here problem. When it comes to research, they don't want research invented here. They want some third party like myself to do it for them because they believe that we will be less biased about the research. I might counter gently that we'll just be biased in a different way <laughs> because we are still humans. Um, but in the meantime, there are lots of accessible tools. You don't have to hire consultants at $2,000 a day and facilities at $1,500 or $2,000 a day in order to collect this unstructured, unlabeled data. You can kind of do this with some existing, much more ex uh, accessible tools. The fourth problem is that you rely on the horse's mouth. You expect customers to say what you want them to say. You want them to say directly the thing that they want. They want this type of feature. They want to be um, communicated to in this particular way. They want the value proposition to be expressed in this particular way. Um, but that doesn't tend to work very often. <laughs> um, and the other problem that's related to that is that means you're only listening for what you want to hear. And we see this sort of meerkat-like activity happening <laughs> in the back rooms of focus group facilities where people suddenly pop up and are alert because they've heard the word or phrase that they were looking for for the last two hours finally uttered and now they're engaged, but they missed everything else. And then the final problem we see is that researchers and clients like tend to trap what they have learned in a PowerPoint deck. Um, and as a result of that, <coughs> they tend to forget or lose most of what they have learned. I was quite literally sitting in a client's office about six months ago, and he was new on the job, brand new marketing director for this company, and was asking about you know, recommendations about what a research plan might be. He decided to turn around and open a desk drawer to find a notepad. And in that desk drawer, which he had not yet opened, was a stack of research decks that had been done over the last three years that no one had briefed him about or even mentioned when he took the job. And that's because it tends to go in what one of my colleagues used to call the round file. <laughs> it's sort of like take that, flick through it through the meeting, and then bin it or just stick it on a shelf where it collects dust. This is not a particularly good way to, uh, to actually try to structure that, that data. 
And then sort of the final thing is, as a result of all of that, you do what you were going to do anyway. So you did all this research, but you just go ahead with the original plan. Um, <laughs> so why should we care? This is a conference about big data, about, about technology, and about quantitative levels of, of, of data that we can structure using all kinds of amazing tools. I think there's the obvious reason, right? Qualitative research tells you the why and the how behind the what of the quantitative data set, which generally speaking allows us to better implement improvements to our products, our features, our campaigns. Um, but it can also reveal opportunities for innovation where the data doesn't exist yet. When you're trying to make a new market, there isn't a lot of great data already sitting out there. There isn't a database already existing for a brand new company and a brand new industry. You have to find information and inspiration somewhere. And qualitative research, especially observational, ethnographic qualitative research, tends to be one of the richest ways that we can collect that information. So how do you do it better? I would say there's a kind of step zero, <laughs> which is level setting. Know why you're doing any research at all, ever. <laughs> Don't do research just because you have a budget for it. Don't do research just because it seems like a good way to kind of cover yourself or save face. Don't do it just because uh, it's always been done. Um, keep in mind sort of two things. For those of you in the room who may be more uh, design influenced, research is not design because it's the process by which we understand problems, whereas design is the process by which we solve problems. Research is part of the design process because it's there to inform these decisions. And if you're more of a strategist, then I would say this is the best definition of strategy I've ever come across. A strategy is a plan for a desired outcome within a set of constraints, time, money, et cetera. So research's job is to feed that strategy and that plan, and out of that plan comes the action you're going to take, the tactics you're going to implement. So if you've got a good reason, you're going to inform a design, inform a strategy, then that's a great reason to do research. You know what your objectives are. Now you can go ahead and go. So the five things I would do to improve research in any of your organizations and that we help a lot of our clients do as well is, first of all, when is the right time to do research? all the time. Um, <laughs> the first thing that we say is don't wait and do it continuously. We worked with Pearson, which is a textbook manufacturer in the US, um, and developed a kind of, this is a very rough draft of a kind of experiment board that we put together with them for them to develop customer hypotheses and go through multiple tests that had a kind of rigor around how they would do analysis and reflection on the outcomes of those tests before designing the next tests, and then another set of experiments that would be related to product or feature hypotheses, things that would solve the customer's problem. This is a continuous ongoing process. They engage in rounds of experiments every three to four weeks, and they continue to do this. We, we did the same thing with peoplemagazines.com team as well. I think the other thing here is to develop better hypotheses. So, you know, I shared with you a couple of bad hypotheses for eBay and the dementia care company, but I think the best way to develop good hypotheses is to start by stating your beliefs. What do you believe to be true about your market, your customers, your product, your competitors? Then restate these beliefs as a hypothesis. If we do this, then this will happen. Design an experiment that tests that hypothesis, observe the results, and reflect on what it means and what to do next. It's a basic sort of scientific method. But we find that if you actually state it up front, then you and your team can hold each other accountable to what those hypotheses were, and you can actually work to make better hypotheses, as opposed to just saying, have you buyers or anybody who spent more than 300 bucks in the last three months? Not a great hypothesis, it turned out. The third thing is using lightweight, affordable tools and automating all you can. This is basically um, using the logos of the companies involved, our workflow for recruiting, scheduling, interviewing, recording, and sharing research that we do with and for our clients. So we have an email database. We s push out an email that recruits people. We sh tell them what the kind of people we're looking for. They opt in by clicking on a button that takes them to a type form survey. They fill out the survey. That goes into a Google spreadsheet. We select people from that group, follow up with a, another email asking them to select a time for us to interview them. We use a tool called Calendly for this, and then we interview them using Uber, Conference, or Skype. We share all of this information in Evernote or Google Docs, and we put it on a shared drive like Dropbox or Google Drive. This way, everyone has access to everything all the time, and we involve the whole team. The, final th the second to last thing is actually reflecting. 
doing research retrospectives. After a project, after a, a set of interviews, after an experiment, we ask people to actually, as a team, reflect on these, these six questions. What did we learn? What decisions can we make as a result? Which decisions will we commit to today? What do we still need to know? And P.S. How will we know when we have learned enough? Because you can kind of keep researching forever. <laughs> um, how are we going to go about learning that? And what will we do next? And finally, make the data, instead of in a PowerPoint deck, <coughs> flat, uh, make it rich and thick. So what we like to do is take a lot of photos, record audio, record video, and then we like to use verbatim qu quotations from respondents. We like to have sort of portraits of them, as well as quick descriptions of who they are. And we make sure that all of these things are kind of linked. So if there is a deck that refers to specific quotes, that links back to the recording. The spreadsheet that has all of the profiles links to the recordings and, and the other documentation. We make sure that all of this is as shareable and as open as possible, and we make sure that everyone gets an opportunity to contribute to it. These are sort of the five big things that we think matter most in doing great qualitative research. But above all, we advise you simply to do this. Be nice and listen. Thanks very much. <laughs>